Hi and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode 56 and uh, as the format goes to an end, I always try to make one episode with someone else's data when we can dissect what they did in uh, their set career in drafting. And this week, uh, well, we have a banger because we have the 17 Lens all-time trophy leader, Florida Man, who is going to talk about his experience in Dominaria United. But before we go into that, uh, just a quick word from the sponsor, that's mtgazon.com. Um, I'm writing articles from them and some other people are writing. Actually, some of the teammates from Draft Lab from Florida Man are writing uh, very good limited articles for the website. Uh, so please go there and click some uh, articles, read some stuff for the new upcoming set because um, well, you want to be prepared for your pre-release. Um, and by doing that, you're well, help hopefully prolonging my career of being a sponsored streamer. Um, but let's move to the business um, because since we have a guest, I'm not going to blab too much. I'm going to ask maybe some questions uh, and we're going to try to see what Florida Man did in Dominar United that was so successful because, well, somehow you always manage to get something successful out of it. Um, so the whole episode is all about learning about yourself. I know that, you know, you do a lot of introspection, but it's very hard to look at the data of other people, especially of large populations of people, when you're already one of the better players there, because there is a limited utility for you, I think, to look at other people's data. But looking at your own data, now that might be something that maybe is more enlightening. So I'm wondering, what are you hoping to get out from looking at your own data from the Dominar United? Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see if there's any kind of like patterns or biases towards like certain color pairs or certain, you know, you know, colors at a base of a deck. Because I try to like think about it and I, you know, it's hard not to just remember the the ridiculous domain decks you have or like the really one off like, oh, that was a cool build. When you do so many, it's just like they kind of blur together. So like pulling out the patterns in the pool of data is what I'm most interested in, seeing if there's anything underlying there. Yeah, I mean, this set was definitely the most annoying one to do at the analysis because normally I just put like, oh, these are your win rates from the um, uh, two color archetypes, but in this format, it just doesn't work. So I actually had to only look at the top 10 of your best archetypes, <laughs> but we're gonna get there at some stage. But before we go to that, um, if you listen to Draft Lab, which you should actually, um, a podcast done by uh, Florida Man and uh, J2S Josh, you will always hear the intro that says that Florida Man is the all time 17 Lens trophy leader. And since I invited Florida Man, I thought, hmm, did anyone ever check if he actually is the all time 17 Lens trophy leader? And um, obviously, I did it. I just took all the leaderboards. Uh, combined them, looked at um, looked at the trophy uh, leaders in there, and 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 calculated. And congratulations, you are the 17 lands all-time trophy leader with 783 trophies um, out of your 7,000 odd games, so um, matches. So uh, pretty well, just ahead of uh, just ahead of just Lola by uh, a meager 243 trophies. So um, uh, quite a gap. You can probably skip one uh, format and you're still going to be fine. <laughs> maybe even two, maybe even three formats you can skip. I came uh, close so to uh, skipping AFR, let me tell you. <laughs> close, but not exactly because I've seen those data. So um, uh, despite this displeasement of the format, you still managed to play quite some few <laughs> drafts in that. <laughs> but OK, now you're officially certified as an all time 17 lens uh, leader. So uh, hopefully you're uh, you're content with that and, and Josh can actually use it, not just bluffing, but actually with some knowledge. I'm glad the data uh, bared out there. OK, so before we start, there's just a bit of stats of the data set we're looking at. It's only going to be the best of one drafts because this season you didn't play too much of best of three, so I skipped it. It would be just two small sample sizes. Data from uh, between the 3rd of September to 28th of October, a meager 175 best of one drafts, uh, 1,060 games roughly. You've drafted, oh, you didn't draft, you logged 7,329 cards during that time. Okay. Your win rate was around 67% and you've drawn 19,239 cards, which is roughly 36.6 kilos in paper if you, if you played it normal. So look how much lifting of weight um, does Arena save you in, the, uh, in those times. 
Um, these are very impressive numbers, I have to say, like 1,060 games um, in drafting in one set. That's plenty. <laughs> so let's look at what you did in those drafts, because that's the important part. And I divide those uh, uh, personal data episodes into two portions, the draft portion based on the uh, draft data, when I'll be looking at the cards that you draft the most, the cards that made your deck the most, um, the cards that you take most frequently when you see them, and uh, a percentage of playing your first pick. Um, and each section, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Maybe you pick one, two, three cards uh, that you think will be on the list of the particular category. And then we can go and see the data and and, and look um, what is in there. So uh, we can start. Which cards do you think you drafted the most from commons and uncommons? And these are um, uh, two separate categories. So uh, first we're going to go through commons and then through uncommons. Sure. So I thought about this a little bit. And I, I imagine you want the comments are going to hit the top are either the ones that are you want to pick over most uncommons and rares. And I came up with a short list of those. I think Talarian Terror is probably the one I would want to pick up the most, but that kind of got contested pretty fast. After that, it's like Repossession or like a Lightning Strike would be a few of my guesses as to like cards I would just kind of grab okay. right off the bat. So let's let's take a look. I mean, number one is Herbal Repossession. Okay. Congratulations, uh, that, that card you picked. Number two is Talarian Gazer. Oh, yeah. uh, just like almost equal. I think that these two cards were probably slightly underpicked by uh, by the general population. You do eat your vegetables because we have Tangled Islet, we have Molten Tributary, uh, Idyllic Bridge Front, so like three lands are in there, and also like three lands that touch on blue. So I think that that's where your focus was. There is a Talarian Terror, obviously. Negate, maybe, is a surprising card that you picked it so frequently. Um, are given Cavalier, Impulse, and Vine Sherpa Prodigy. Now, Lightning Strike is not there, but it's mainly because you didn't see it very often, because uh, this was the most challenged common of all the commons in the set. Hmm. Are there any cards that you find surprising on this list? Or uh, you kind of you kind of pointed out Negate. I think Negate's one of those cards I value a little highly than people and can get on the wheel, so that I assume that's why. It made the list. Just I don't think I was picking it in the first eight picks too often, but probably off the wheel a lot. Vine Shipper mm. Prodigy is probably I don't know. It, there's probably a big clump right around this eighty to seventy range. There I is imagine. a big clump. So, I mean, uh, you, you 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 know how data works because um, uh, not 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 all of you do know, but uh, uh, you are uh, scientifically quite uh, literate as uh, as a person working in science. Yes. So you know how uh, how the data is distributed. So that's exactly what happens. There's a, like a large clump of cards uh, probably around that uh, area. Yeah, but I mean, Impulse and, and Tolarian Terror and Geyser all kind of want to be doing the same thing in the same deck. So, you know, I'm not surprised to see them kind of clustered at the top. And Cavalier, I think, is the white common that is the standout and signal of like, oh, I should get into white if this is coming a little later than I, it should. I can totally see it see it happening. It's like, oh no, the blue is not flowing. Oh, there's a late cavalier. Let's go. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, what do you think about the uncommons? Which uncommons do you think are the, your, your top uh, top picks? Yeah, uncommons a little harder. I I think like you know, chaplains are so contested. Even though I see kind of every one I see, I I tried to take. I don't think that would make the list. It's it's a bit harder, I think. I'm trying to. F I don't have a good memory for all the uncommons. I think like Brawler is probably something I want to take. Sprouting Goblin, I see come later than I think most other uncommons for its power level. So maybe that makes it. But the thing that makes me hesitant about that is that it's kind of a two color card versus other uncommons. So I, I gotta be honest, I don't have a great answer for uncommon. So I, I okay, you said Brawler, you said. Um... Goblin, yes, Sprouting Goblin. Yeah, yeah. I think the number one will be quite surprising to you. Okay. Oh, Erg. Erg, Spawn of Turg. Uh, I think that it's a miss on Wizards' behalf not to make it a Timur card because Erg is perfect Timur card name. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that Erg, Erg and uh, and actually Volkar Vodalian, whatever it is, Vodalian something, um, these two are just going so much later than any other uncommon, and you just probably speculated on those quite a lot not necessarily playing them at the time. Mm -hmm. Micromancer is another card that was going quite late, and it's a very good card, so that's why you probably picked so many of them. We have a Nishoba Brawler, now that card is just pure busted. Tail yep. Swipe, um, 
I think that you are the kind of person that will enjoy that kind of card. <laughs> well, if you're picking up Micromancers, you should be picking up Tail Swipes. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, then you have the Fires of Victory, Frost Strider, Territorial Romaro, Weather Seed Treaty, and Strength of the Coalition. That was, I think, the card that surprised me the most on your list. Obviously, there will be plenty of them that are quite close, um, like quite close um, on that particular list. Any surprises yeah. here except for Erg? <laughs> yeah, Erg. I mean, Erg is surprising. I, 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 it feels like I drafted more um, Frostfist Striders. I'm surprised to see that so low on the list, and then. Um... Yeah, I I also feel like uh, Vohar. I didn't draft quite as highly, uh, even though I, I value it very high. I just felt like I didn't. But see I, I as think many. Vohar wheels like 30 percent of the time when you uh, open it in the pack, so that's probably why you got yeah. them because they yeah. And also, I I find it very charming that you have Territorial Maro equally drafted with Weather Seed Treaty as these two cards <laughs> are just so busted together. I know, right? No one no one likes a, a turn four ten ten more than I. Mm, I can I can imagine that, and uh, you know, with those Urbok repossessions getting back the weather seed treaty, it might be quite back breaking. Um, so these are the uncommons. Um, but uh, drafting a card is one thing, but uh, actually drafting and then playing now that's dedication. So what do you think? Which which cards um, did you play most frequently when you when you drafted them? So which cards almost always made your deck? And I'm going to give you some uh, hints. Um, it's going to be probably mainly uncommons in this list, but there are some commons as well. Yeah, OK. I would I would say, yeah, Small Sam brings up a good point. Chaplin, if you're drafting that, you're probably jamming into your deck, especially if you're picking them early. I don't know if I've had it more than 10 times. I think I have. Um, I, I think Micromancer, I usually find want to find a way to jam into my deck somehow. It's an easy to splash, and there's kind of a target in all the colors. Uh, Brawler doesn't go into every deck. I'm trying to think of other things. Anything that's like top end and single pip is probably going to be the thing on the list since there's so much fixing in this set. Okay. Um, maybe small, small, um, small adjustment. I think that because in the end, your, your data set was so big that I did uh, draft it over 10 times, 20 times. And it was still plenty of cards in there, but that won't affect anything. Okay. But the top card that you've always played when you drafted it was Resolute Reinforcement. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, you drafted it exactly 20 times and you played it exactly 20 times. And I think it's because you only drafted it when you wanted it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it always made the deck because it is a good card if you play some kind of a um, white, blue, or white, red aggro. And then we have like... Uh, Prayer of Binding, Sunlit Marsh, I think, again, this is the kind of one of those lands that you really want to play them when you draft them. Mm -hmm. um, Most Spirit Ancient, is that surprising that you almost always played it when you drafted it? That's the 7-7, seven, seven, right? Yeah, that's the 7-7 seven, seven that gains 5. <sighs> well, I regretted playing it this morning when I drafted it. I don't know what that, <laughs> and, and yet <laughs> what that played means. It. And yet you played it. Um, and yeah, then you have like a collection of different cards. Like you have the Tangled Islet. Uh, uh, I guess that it's just like such a key domain land that you will probably almost always play it. I think that's the best. Striders, domain, Extinguish the Light, Yavimaya Icon Iconoclast, Tail Swipe, and Cut Down. So these are the cards. I actually found this list slightly surprising. But I think that like Micromancer doesn't make it because um, you will occasionally have those when you maybe pick it late but you don't have the one drop spells and then you just won't play it true yeah i'm surprised to see cut down because like that's not a card i would splash and i still take it relatively high before i know i'm in black so i guess i'm a little surprised to see that and then which card guess... are you surprising not to see actually because I, I have the data in front of me so i can tell you uh, exactly how frequently you play the particular card when you well, I guess like I don't like I said, Chaplin might be because of a frequency issue versus a no, no, Chaplin. No? You you drafted you drafted enough Chaplins. Chaplin is going to have a special slide because actually I'm going to talk about it uh, in separate category there. All right, all right. Chaplin, uh, Chaplin was a very weird outlier in your data set, and I actually wanted to ask you some questions and because I was wondering myself what's going on in there. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, I think I'm surprised to see Iconoclast on there. Uh, I guess it's a it's a good two green drop no matter what. So I guess I, I guess these class... cards are very flexible. Um, either these cards are flexible or they go into the one deck and I don't pick them unless I know I'm in the one deck. Mm. Yeah, so probably that's that might, might be the case with the Iconoclast. You drafted it 29 times and you played 27 times uh, yeah. in terms of Iconoclast. 
And Micromancer, um, you drafted 51 times and you played 43 times. So 85% of times you did play it. So that's the that's the that's the slight drop off. Yeah. And Wing Mendel Chaplin, by the way, drafted 24 times, played only 13. So uh, barely yeah. over 50%. How about um, um I'm I'm curious about specifically Tellarian Terror because I usually probably spec on it early as as much as I could in the in like the mid portion of the format and I guess it was just like a matter if the deck was open or not if it made it Tellarian Terror it was just off the list you drafted it 94 times and you played it 84 times okay yeah so it was just probably like just just of the of the of the uh, of the list yeah it was just like three percentage points lower than the cutoff i made gotcha it was close it was close um all right well then that that's the oh that's always my favorite one <laughs> which cards that never made your deck did you draft the most i mean these have to be like the stuff you you pick on the wheel that you're just like whatever it doesn't matter um I gotta say, I feel like I pick up a lot of thrill possibilities without ever playing them. I <laughs> know uh, uh, you played thrill. You you played thrill. I can tell you that. You okay. Played okay. Um. Oh boy, this is hard. Uh, what are the cards like? Maybe the steel and sack card. I forget the name of that. Must have played it or must have never drafted it. But uh, okay. it's not on my list. There are five cards on that list. I think oh, there is one uncommon and four commons. I'm surprised Maybe. to even see a, a com uncommon on there. Um. Yeah, I'm kind of drawing a blank on this. Uh, it doesn't help that I'm not great with the names. I'm trying to think oh, of yeah. uh, Vanquisher's Axe. That might be a good one. Oh, okay. We'll, 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 get, we'll, give, we'll give you. We'll give you that. We'll give you that. Vanquisher <laughs> Axe number one. Thirty-seven times drafted, zero times played. We never played Bark with Crusher, which I think is the two-five that has uh, enlist. Hammerhand uh, and Aura that um, gives plus one, plus one, the sort of cartouche kind of field. The 3 2 Voda C Scavenger that um, scries ish for domain. And Yotia declares war, the uh, Ethan Sachs invitational card. And uh, never, you never, you never manage to play that one. You leave this kind of stuff for Ethan. Man, the um, Yotia declares war and Vanquisher's Axe are just sitting in the sideboard together looking at each other. Yeah, no, they're. they're, 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 they're <laughs> You know, this is this kind of transformative sideboard that you never use in best of one, but might maybe, maybe one day. Yeah. So Sam brings up a good of... point. I did play a Vanquisher's Axe the other day, but it must have been like the day after you you locked the data. No, yeah, I think my my cutoff was uh, my cutoff was already a week ago uh, because yeah. I had to get the data earlier to get everything prepared. So uh, all the stuff uh, from last two days uh, don't work. I think that when I did this episode with uh, with protocols. He actually had zero percent win rate in Izzet decks, and he literally came from his own stream to do uh, a stream with me, and and he just trophied with an Izzet deck, but it was not in the data, so uh, <laughs> sucks to be him. Um, okay, snap picks. Which cards you have taken almost every time you sold them, and then uh, cards that you've seen twenty times or more? Oh man. Well, I feel like I've seen drag under twenty times or more, even though it's a rare. Just, 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 just to be clear, uh, I, I split it into uncommons and commons, and first okay. we go with uncommons. Um, almost oh, every time you saw yeah. them. No, it's, 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 it's rares are also making that, but you know, very few rares because it's they don't make the frequency. But there's sure, one sure. rare that made it on the list. Is that rare drag under? No. Oh, it's either that or her migration. I feel like, but maybe not. Um. Which cards? Uh, every time I see them, I take them. I'm trying to think of my pet cards. Uh, Geyser might be one of the higher so ones. Let's start with the uncommons, maybe, because uh, okay. I have the uncommon slides first. Okay. Uh, Brawler might be it. Uh, Chaplain could be one. I hate saying Chaplain so much. I feel like that's all anyone talks about in this set. Um, other uncommon frost fist i do like a lot but double blue makes me hesitant to say like i snap pick it i'm trying to think of the things that you you always kind of want you know at uncommon I, I should bring up like a card list honestly i'm a visual i'm a visual learner i need to see the oh yeah just go and go and scryful and just uh just just look through the through the through the spoilers but um i think that you know brawler is there i, I can tell you that already okay um, I see the chat is also participating. Chuck Noblock, Chuck Noblock 
no blocks maybe but you know some of the people in chat maybe actually know um uh, how you draft better than you do because they watch you all the time so uh, yeah be... and and i have but, a terrible memory for this kind of stuff i'm more but, like but, memorize the set but i don't remember runa's it. vortex is not there that's that i can tell you but brawler is there 62 percent of the time that you see okay. it you pick it it still loses with prayer of binding and prayer binding that makes sense that makes was one sense. of the highest picks yeah super easy to splash as well uh Weather Seed Treaty, well, easy to splash other things. The only rare that made it was the Silver Scrutiny. You picked it 60% of the time. Ah, um, OK. Uh, and then you have like um, Micromancer, Pyrexian Missionary, Tail Swipe, Knight of Dusk Shadow, Terra Sunder, and Hurloon Battle In. I, all these cards, I think, that make more or less sense for me. Mm -hmm. Silver Scrutiny may be surprising to some because not. I don't think everyone was high on this card, but uh, can you give me a rationale behind that, picking that so highly? Yeah, so you saw a bias towards blue, I think, in the common, uncommon, like, frequency pick stuff. So that probably has something to do with it. But I kind of talked about this with Beers SC um, during a podcast episode, where Silver Scrutiny gives you the flex a lot of flexibility in your deck because it gives you, like, uh, a high amount of card draw in one card. So you can, instead of playing, like, two or three Phyrexian Espionage or other card draws to get critical massive card draw in the type of deck you want to draw cards in, you could just kind of play Silver Scrutiny and then you could replace like the extra cards with like something that'll keep you alive longer, like a cut down or something that'll find Silver Scrutiny instead, like an impulse. So I, I, I think it, it, I think it like kind of, it's a, it's a really powerful card that, that f kind of opens up some flex slots in your deck. So that's why I, I think I like it more than the average person. All right. Um, so we have the commons now, um, and you know, I mean, obviously, uncommons and and rares will be in this sixty five to fifty to forty five percent range. Uh, commons will be in the forty to twenty to forty two to twenty two percent range uh, of, of of picking them when you see them. What do you think? Which commons made it in top ten? Uh, ter uh, terror. I have to go with geyser. I probably have to go with. Um... Yeah, I think I think repossession, lightning. It's all the same stuff I'm gonna say before. I think lightning yeah, strike, and, cavalier. <laughs> and I think that you're you're much higher here because like lightning strike is number one. Okay. It was not in the top ten commons because you just didn't see it enough, but you definitely prioritized the card like forty two point seven percent of the time that you seen it, you took it. Gazer, terror, repossession, extinguish the light is a card that you never mentioned, but uh, it mm. seems that you also enjoy playing with it uh, quite a lot. Uh, Cavalier, and then you have a big drop off, and you have uh, uh, four four lands that basically <laughs> are. So I guess that this is your list of the top commons of the of the set. Like, if you would probably be pushed to say which which commons do you do you think are the best in the whole set? These are the six, and then the rest is the lands, the the important stuff to make actually our decks work. So that absolutely makes sense to me. Um, all right. In the middle of it, we have a game. <laughs> and the game is card X or aggressive sabotage. Which card do you pick more frequently? And I have five guesses for you to make. And we're going to try to see if you can if you can at least redo this one. Um, so the question is, do you pick aggressive sabotage more frequently, frequently when you see it, or rather the coalition warlord, for example? So uh, if you pick aggressive sabotage, 4% of the time that you see it will rather be lower than that or something like that. Yeah, what do I get if I get all five right? Is there a prize? Uh, if you get all five right, you get um, a, a, a slow clap from me. That's, okay. that's, that's okay. as much as I can give. I'm, I'm gonna hold you to that. This one I'm going with aggressive sabotage. I, I have a distaste for Rada, unless I have. No, no you picked Rada more. Oh. Boom, already no slow claps. So I just got good. one uh, bad, But what one do I get if, if you get all five? Uh, <laughs> Uh, the difference is very small. Um, okay, aggressive sabotage and slime put survey. Uh, I'm gonna go sabotage again, even though just because I picked up many slime foots earlier this week. But <laughs> you pick more of the slime foot survey. So 11, 11 and a half percent of the time, uh, you pick uh, slime foot survey when you um, when yeah. you when you see it, and only 10.5 aggressive sabotage. Okay. Right. Aggressive sabotage or founding of the third path? No, I want. I like founding of the third path, so I'm going to say it, and it's going to be wrong. But I'm going with founding of the third path. 
Oh, okay. No, it is. It is. You picked. You picked it much higher. I was actually surprised that you like it so much. So I, I, I put it in there, uh, maybe to get an, an answer. But now I know you like the card. You're, two, you're one and two. That's good. One I think it's two. underrated. This card a lot. So you found success with it as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got to buy back a uh, herd migration with it, so I'll just say that. <laughs> okay, that. Yeah, that, that 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 that's probably enough. Yeah. Um, aggressive sabotage or colossal growth? I think colossal growth is a good card, but I think I'm. They're both commons, and I think I'm usually in a place where I spec on sabotage more than a colossal growth. Yes. All correct. Right. Wow, you're you're grinding back. I think that you're learning the game as we play it. There, and there uh, you go. That's usually what happens, you know. I get the people in the first two, and then they just bounce back and win with me. Damn it! Okay, we have aggressive sabotage and goblin picker. I've, it's got to be goblin picker. I'd be shocked if it's not. Yes. Yes. Oh. <laughs> really? So unfortunately, you have uh, fought valiantly, but it's a two-three. But this is all. Uh, I, I do this game segment because this is a part of my uh, explanation of the data part of the of the mm. episode. It's just basically you have to think about the least draft cards. What do they mean actually? And um, cards that you never pick are the ones where you disagree with the rest of the Magic world the most. So if you had the worst card ever, and in this case I have a Wooberg Seven a Legendary Creature Human Jester. It's a one one, and if you draft it, you lose the next three matches. Like no one would ever want to pick this card. I mean. Mm because you basically auto lose your draft. But you would pick it 12.5% of the times that you see it. Because since no one would pick it, if it was open and you would be in lucky spot, you would just get it as a sort of, you know, um, uh, old maid in, 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 in the hard game. So 12.5 will be very frequently um, the frequency that you pick the cards that are absolutely terrible because they will just wheel and you will get them last pick. Uh, which means that everything under 12.5 are going to be the cards that you actively disagree with the rest of the people on the table. Because if it's under that, they take it, but you don't. So that's why I like to run some stats on the cards that you are having really, really low uh, percentage of, of, of picking them. So um, which cards do you think you pick almost never? And I'm going to look at the data. You have exactly two cards. Okay. Exactly two cards that you've seen many times but you never picked them ever, not even once. Oh boy. And one of them, you've, one of them, and that, that was amazing to me. One of them you've seen 113 times <laughs> without ever picking it. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm just scrolling through the, the comments real quick. Just, just. It's an uncommon. I can give you that. One is, is that... an uncommon, one is a rare. Okay, okay, that makes more sense. For some reason, I was thinking, man, it's an uncommon I've never taken. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Okay, uh, just give me one sec here. Something, as soon as I see it, I think I'll know it. Ooh, Sanguir Connoisseur. I can't, I can't say the name. Uh, no, I don't think oh. so. I think that you've taken Sanguir Connoisseur at some stage. I don't know why you did it, but, uh, but you did. Uh, it's Tura Kenerud, the Sky Knight, the 5 mana 3-3 three, three that makes 1-1 one, one soldiers. Never? I've never taken never. that card. <laughs> never once. Never once. Not a single oh, time. wow. And the other and the other card is another Ethan uh, Ethan Sachs special, the Rata Drabik of Urberg. So yeah, these are the two cards that you've never picked. And apart from that, you have like collection of um, questionable rares in uh, Sulfur Springs. I mean, I, I guess you never you didn't play much of the red black. I think you were actively avoiding that color just by judging other cards that I've seen through. Scrolling through the data, Thran Portal, Chaotic Transformation, Joyra, a uh, couple of those um, uh, Tribal Lords, the Runefeld Horde Master and the Shadow mm -hmm. Rite Priest, Phasing of Zelfir, even though you like blue, not that type of blue, I guess. And one common that you basically never picked is Tattered Apparition, um, huh. which is a weird card in this set because this is the card where, you know, that 17 lands has the top players and the bottom players. Mm -hmm. This card is like... The worst card for top players, they have the lowest win rate with it. And the bottom players have actually a higher than average win rate by playing that card or by drawing that card. So it's a, sometimes where you have miscommunication between grinders and, and beginner players is that <laughs> things work differently for them, it seems. But OK, um, so these are your least drafted cards. And here we come to our data on. Oh, yeah, sorry, I still have the comments. Yep. 
Oh, um, I didn't really I still see have those. Only, only commons. So what do you think? Which which commons were the ones that you never were picking? Yeah, I have to get my mind back focused after that Sky Knight stat. That blows my mind. I can't believe. Um, let's see, comments. Uh, the, the turtle is probably one I reluctantly pick on the wheel if it comes around. Um, what else in the comments? I think I said something going into this. Uh, let me see. I'm really bad with card names. I apologize. Yeah, it's fine. I need a visual. Hammer hands got to be something that goes late. Uh, Juniper, I feel like I don't pick that often because I'm just not in Selesnia too often. The okay, let's let, let, let's stop it there because I think that you got enough of this stuff. And uh, it is that there definitely is Juniper Order Root Weaver, mm -hmm. which was a surprise for me because at the same time, I saw that you were quite highly picking the strength of Coalition, but Juniper Order Root Weaver was not something that you were at all interested in playing just didn't work for you or you, you I, just played just lesnia i think is very very hard to get in and strength of coalition you can kind of spec on and splash in like a green domain deck whereas it doesn't go the other way around so much i was also surprised by academy wall that you were <laughs> really actively not picking that card i kind of like academy wall i don't i don't think it's necessary in the wall deck so much i think it's one of the weaker walls for that deck uh, but I think it's good in like the very spell heavy deck. Uh, but it's fighting with a lot of stuff in in the three drop slot, so maybe that's why. Yeah, exactly. And I think that if if if, if you want to be in the heavy spell deck, you want the spells to be open, and then hopefully you won't have to play the academy wall because you will get actual good spells instead of it. Yeah. But yeah, okay. Uh, I think that the biggest surprise on that list for me was the juniper order root weaver. That how how, and also. Misa Cavalier, um, uh, slightly, but that 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 will come to that point later. Don't, don't worry. There, there there is a reason why I thought that it was a bit surprising. I think if my memory uh, okay. was jogged, Snare Spinner and Sea Scavenger would have uh, popped up to the top too. Those are pretty obvious cards. Yeah, drafted. Yeah, for the Sea Scavenger. But so let's look at the Wing Mantle Chaplain, and okay. um, I'm going to go. So first of all, you picked it only 43% of the times that you've seen it. That's at the same time as Lightning Strike. That's at, at the same uh, frequency as Lightning Strike, which obviously Lightning Strike you've seen much, much more frequently. Mm -hmm. But then you only played it like half the time that when, when, when you picked it. And that was super surprising to me because when I look at the data from, oh, come on. When I look at the data from um, other cards uh, that are close to it, mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of the frequency of picking, um, you play them 80, 70, 90% of the time. And there is this lone wing mental chaplain that you only play half of the time from those cards. So, um, you, because you were not even uh, like when you were describing the cards and you were, when you were guessing, you were thinking about the wing mental chaplain, but it seems to me like you actively didn't want to play it, or at least that you maybe hate drafted it a couple of times because it's an annoying card, but. What happened there? What do you think? Yeah, so I think you have to put, like, in my mind, I put Wingman, and this is probably why I brought it up so much. I put this in a totally different category of other cards since it's a build around, and none of the other uncommons that I'm picking around this, you know, frequency, I guess, aren't really build arounds. They just go in the color they're in. And so I'm very, like, I don't want to get into the walls deck unless it's open. So if I don't see Wing Mantle pack one, pick one, I generally try not to take it in pack two and three. And if I do see Wing Mantle in pack one, I I don't generally try to hard false wall, walls. I try to see if the walls wheel and then like go all in on it. Whereas think I think if people pack one pick one is they just like start taking walls immediately following it. Um, so I think I'm I think I'm a little lower on Chaplin than most of people in terms of its its absolute power level. Therefore, I'm more willing to like kind of move off of it. Mm. I still, I still need the lane to be open to want to play this. Like, this is just not enough. Taking this like, yeah, and forcing I mean, it is like not enough for me. I think I pick pick one pack one. I would just like slam it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's. Um, it, I think that later in the season it was also slightly more tricky to play it because people learned a bit how to how to deal with it, and uh, mm -hmm. it was. I think that you get freebies in the in the first half of the format uh, by, by having wing metal chaplain in your deck in general. Um, okay, 
um, forcing factor. And this is how much do you stick to your first pick? And an average 17 lens user plays their first pick 80% of the time, roughly. Mm. So where, where do you think you land in that? I, I hope I'm lower than that, but I definitely have memories of sticking to my uh, first pick more frequently than I should. Why, I would say why, why, I would. Mm -hmm. Why do you hope to be lower than that? What's because I think too thing? too high of a number indicates that you're inflexible and you don't know how to like, or not that you don't know, but you're you could. I don't implode. know, or, or that you pick cards that are easy to accommodate in multiple decks. Uh, I mean, good... this is a multi-format color. I mean, if you pick the right cards, you can probably play almost everything when you have some domain. That's a good. I, I that's a good point since there's so much splashing. So yeah, maybe so maybe in this set it's better for like since you have so much this, flaxing, it's better just yeah. to pick a high quality card you know we can jam in any deck. So this this is like a very weird stat in there that um, uh, the number of, um, uh, of of the times of the the frequency of playing the first pick is very uniform across across the board mm. for all the kinds of win rates. Like if you win one game in the draft or if you win seven, it doesn't make a difference. But there's many drafts with zero wins that people just don't play their first pick. And I think it's just that huh. they put random cards in and, and, and concede or something. But we still get it in the data. That was always mind-boggling for me why, why there is this weird, weird uh, one-off point. Uh, but you you end up on 85.7%. Oh, okay. So not far from the average, but slightly above. And I think that, um, honestly, I, I, I never thought that it's a bad thing to be... Um, uh, to be wanting to to be able to actually carve a path that allows you to play your first pick because why wouldn't you and i think that I'm, i don't take you for a player that will just stick to it blindly i, I sometimes do it uh, guilty as charged but i don't think that you're a kind of a person that will stick blindly to your first pick you know when to abandon it it's just that you're able to play it more frequently than the other because you just draft better That's do you is this is this um is this a cross sets or only for dmu the stat this is only for DMU. Yeah. Do you have off the top of your head? Do you have a like memory of like what the stat is for other sets? I, I it, yeah, it's from the other from the other sets, it was like eighty point two. That's I think oh. from Street of New Capena. Oh. Uh, this is I I redid these and this analysis for um uh for um for DMU with slightly different results. Gotcha. So people played by like two percentage points more frequently their first pick. And I don't have, of course, the data for you for other sets because I only got the DMU sure, data. Sure. Yeah, I'm just curious if that number drops in like traditional two color sets with low fixing. Slightly. Yeah. Slightly, but uh, but not by much. I was I was surprised. I thought that it would be yeah. maybe higher here. But people stick to their first pick quite a lot. True. True. Okay, that concludes our um, draft portion. Now we go to the play portion. And of course, play data is much more difficult to interpret, but um, uh, especially the win rates, there is a caveat. We're going to look at the win rates over time. We're looking at your color preference and your win rates, but all of those are based on slightly small numbers. So um, they are interesting numbers to look at, but keep in mind that the error rates uh, and the variance is quite high on those uh, before we go into some solid conclusions. There is still going to be some maybe interesting things to figure out. And, and you know, um, uh, your, your numbers are small, but not so small. Uh, that's, that, that's the point. <laughs> so before that, um, just for the audience, uh, we're going to look a lot about on um, running averages. And basically what happens is that when you have those chaotic data sets, and especially when you have like win or loss, uh, and you plot them, they will look awful. So instead of that, what I do is I look at the average of 10 points or 20 points or 100 points and step by step calculate them. And, and uh, by taking all those steps calculated, I can come up with a graph that looks slightly different like this. And this is the basically average of those points and that shows you, allows you to track the average over some time uh, and how it changes uh, without having this kind of chaotic kind of uh, graph that tells you nothing basically. Um, and first we're going to look at your running average of your win rate, where I basically took snapshots of 100 games and uh, proceeded uh, with them across the time. Um, so how did your confidence in the format look like? So when do, when do you think is your most winning years period and, and least winning years period? 
Yeah. So I think generally speaking for every format, it's something like this where like the first few days or maybe the first week high win rate, just because a lot of people fled back to arena and play and maybe a little more casual. No one knows what's going on. And I did a set review. So I have a leg up and then it, and then it kind of, you know, probably stabilizes to where it should and slowly climbs over time. When I learn the format nuances a bit better and try to out meta the meta. And then towards the end of the format, I think it starts to slump off because I get bored and lose discipline or something. <laughs> is my is my like general guess. What, 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 why do we need me for in this? Like when you can do your own data without me actually plotting it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that this is your initial weekend or initial couple of days of the format. You get a you know your your average win rate is sixty seven percent, which is still quite high. You have a you had a drop off then. Uh, this might have been some long weekend or something. Um, yeah, vacation or, yeah. for, or forgot to turn on the 17 lands um but you had a slight drop on there and then you sort of climbed back into quite high win rates in the mid format and then it sort of tailed off a bit in the in the in the last uh, last last weeks of the data that i had so uh, mm -hmm. it's very much what you described but um we can put some kind of uh, numbers in that and there were a bit of jumps you know there is variance you hit the streak uh, of of, of uh, of lower win rates. I'm pretty sure that there was a lot of uh, frustration on your streams in that particular <laughs> period. How come they always draw it? They always yeah. have it. Ah! <laughs> but yeah, it's exactly what you described. Um, but this is not all. Um, here comes my art intrusion, you know. Uh, Picasso, uh, in his painter's career, had a blue period and a rose period. Um, and magic players during the draft format, they usually have their particular <laughs> colors uh, being drafted more than others. Uh, what do you think? When when was your green, black, blue, and white periods in, uh, in during the oh. Dominaria? Oh boy, I would say white was somewhere in the middle because I think it was like Defor was was in my ear talking talking up tokens, and I think I probably was like, oh, let me give this a try. Um, blue, I. I think green was probably up front because like it felt like the domain stuff was easier to get to in the beginning or more appealing to me. Blue was probably filling in the gaps when anything else wasn't happening, but maybe more towards the end or late. And then black, I, I actually don't know. It, it's probably some transition around the tokens period of white because like white, black go well together. But if you have to bail on the, the white part of that plan, that's a very, 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 again, again, I, I'm, my job here is just uh, presenting what you just said uh, without looking at the graphs. Uh, it's not exactly 100% like that. I mean, sure. you started with green, that was for sure. Then, as you said, fill in the gaps with blue. Um, then you had your green period, and that was like insane. Like you almost stopped drafting white at that stage. Um, so there was very little white that you played. And you played like 95% of your decks had some green at the peak of it. Yeah. That's across 100 games. So that's like <laughs> across 100 games, which is not 100 drafts, that's not the same. Uh, but across 100 games, uh, 96 of them had green as a main color. So that's uh, that's quite impressive. Then you can see that there was this um, black period. And also, there was the increase of white. So you might be right that there was the black white and also some black blue at the time. Then you had another of those transition periods when you, I think, might have drafted more of the blue red. And I think that you had this Demir period here that you basically played quite a lot of uh, blue and black uh, together. And um, these are the last couple of games, so that's probably you know separate. So anything surprising in that picture? Uh, poor Red never got It's Time to Shine. <laughs> well, I mean, for, for the right reasons, I think, for the right reasons. I think that here you did play a bit of the uh, Gaia Smite uh, kind of um, yeah. red-green aggro because it was atrociously open at that time. Um, but what we have also, what, I, what, what technology we have is actually trying to compare your win rates with your, oh. um, uh, with your periods. So we can actually see like the biggest success that you had was basically when you were drafting those white black decks and, um, and to some extent the Izzet decks um, um, and, and, and your doldrums were when you were over drafting the green, I think uh, that was... Uh, <laughs> That yeah, was maybe, and it looks yeah. like it looks like I caught on and quickly shifted. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly. But you know, I mean, the, the, this this is the sort of things that um, you know, personal data might um, might give you a better 
confirmation of what you feel because you know we feel a lot of things and sometimes they're right sometimes they're wrong but when you're confronted with data you can get a more or less uh, clear view of that um what i also did was i looked at uh, the number of colors you played and this counts <laughs> flashes so uh okay. um you basically i mean this was a multicolor format so you see uh, you played like average uh 3.2 3.8 color colors in the deck so um you always had a lot of them like that means that you played quite a lot of decks that had all five colors in them somehow and of course <laughs> splashing one card is not was not difficult um and you basically started maybe conservatively then you increased the, the number of colors but that was also in the period when you had um not the most successful time then you dropped off and you started drafting fewer colors and that's when you had those peaks and i think that that's why i think that it was mainly caused by the white black and uh, blue red in those times and you actually yeah boosted your win rate by trying to um uh draft more, more co cohesive decks and then you just like went okay i'm just gonna draft <laughs> five color decks all the time and that's how you continue till the end of the season yeah, and also like if you're playing a lot of green, you should be splashing. If you're playing white black decks, you should not be splashing. Yeah, exactly, another, exactly, like, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so which color combinations were you the most successful with? And uh, I picked top ten. So the least successful Oof. are not exactly the least successful. Um, and just to give you an impression of what's going on in there, I don't only pick the two color combinations, but I also pick all the three color combinations and i also picked um four color decks as a separate category because you had enough of them and i don't think there is a point splitting four color decks uh, yeah if it's, um, you know, yeah, everything but white is like <laughs> one of the decks um so yeah for three and two color decks uh i think you know when when boros came together it was very strong when is it came together it was very strong i think is it and jeskai are kind of interchangeable in a way where like i i wouldn't rule out a jeskai deck from being very different from is it if you're splashing right um, I, I can tell you I, before we go i can tell you that there's four color combinations that are head and shoulders above anything else hmm. and then there's like one in between and then there's five of them that are pathetic win rates i have to say like like pathetic Oof. yeah around 65 percent of pathetic Oh, just, okay. just, just um because i don't look at them um i can i i have the technology to look at the uh i have the technology to look at the 10 color combinations that i didn't um or do i have the technology maybe i don't have that technology damn it where be you my 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 data <laughs> Oh, did I delete it? Oh, probably I did delete it. Okay, I don't have the technology to look All at right. the 10 color, color combinations that uh, that you did poorly with. Um, Cause they mainly because they ma mainly because it was like Simic that you played like 12 games and it was not very good because uh, Simic was not good. So I, I just skipped them. But I, I looked at the 10 combinations that you played um, around 50 games or more, basically. So yeah i don't know if okay so if i had checked like the top four i think like sultai like josh says probably up there there's a it felt like there's a period that I couldn't lose i wouldn't know to put is it or and or just guy in there i think one of those is but probably not both even though i guess logically you would think if one's in the other should be in um and then like black black white is i think very strong when it comes together so maybe that that's in there so like those kind of four decks I don't think. Okay, let's look. Yeah. Oh, so your best colors? combination was actually four colors, seventy-two percent right. win rate with that, and then you have is it seventy-two, uh, Timur with seventy-one point seven, and uh, oh. and 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 Gruel actually with seventy-one point oh. four, and then there's a slight drop off with um, white black, mm -hmm. and then you have this sort of like, I mean, it's still a it's still a very good win rate. It's, it's still a very sure. good win rate. Of uh, Demir, um, Jeskai, uh, Sultai, White Red, and uh, Esper, and the other uh, and the other combinations were just under the fifty games, so I didn't take them into account because you know, one game won, one game lost changes quite a lot in those. So, yeah, very interesting. Uh, I I feel like 
I, th- I think red green is not in like top of mind because I don't think I played it as much. Maybe I did. Maybe I just have some bias in my memory. But like you might because it, you know the the, the ha, it counts splashing in the in the red green as well. So uh, yeah, it, it might be that there was plenty of those like half teamer decks that that had grew base basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even like everything after the four colors, just some combination of teamer, right? So it's. It is indeed, yeah. yeah. So I guess Teamer was the place to be. I guess, yeah. Uh, maybe for, for maybe it has the it has the most cards where you could just kind of pivot around with early picks and, and make something work. Mm. Uh, yeah, and no, one one thing I, I was surprised that your white red results were not that great, and I think that we will see that later when you look at the card win rates uh, that were at least surprising. Uh, to me in terms of um, how it looked like. So yeah, card win rates. Um, we have game games played win rate and games in hand win rate. Uh, games played, of course, looks at all the games when the card was in the deck. So this more this shows, of course, how powerful the individual card is, but it also puts quite a lot of weight on the decks that the card will be in. And games in hand win rate puts more weight on the card itself and less on the deck that it's in. So uh, that's why I look at both of those statistics just to see which cards you made your decks tick and at the same time um, which cards um, um, which cards were just powerful individually uh, when you drew them. And obviously um, it is minimum 30 games or maybe 20. I have to double check. Um, which means that games played will have a much bigger card set because of course you you you, you have cards in your decks um, always and you draw them like roughly 50% of the time, 45% of the time that you play them. So uh, some cards that are on the list of the uh, cards with games played will not make it to the list of the games in hand because there's just not enough data and sample size for that. Sure. So what do, you, what do you think? What is your top game games played card? And I can tell you there's one card that is just absolute runaway, number one. It's on the lower limit of the numbers because it's a mythic rare. Oh, it's a mythic rare. A mythic rare actually made it to the number one. The rest of the cards are rares uh, and uncommons mainly. A mythic rare, you say? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's games played, so I don't know how many times you drew it, but um, um, but whenever you had it in your deck, you won. Seven out of eight games you had it in your deck, you won. <laughs> uh maybe it's shivan devastator so close is, no, is it? it's no. not but the it, opposite. it's close but, okay so try to guess a couple of uncommons then maybe okay a couple of uncommons so games that i played them in and i've won uh let's see again looking at the list because my memory sucks I think maybe um, Elas, Sadistic Pilgrim, could be really strong there. It kind of makes a black-white deck tick. Um, I, I think Joda's Codex, if you end up actually casting that card, it, it really gets you ahead. But this this is the, the game's plate, so it's just it being in the deck. So, oh, uh, it, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. This is this okay, is so, so it's not 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 casting. Cast, that would be the next category when we have the games in hand statistics. I see. Okay. Um. So just like in the deck, uh, I think cards that are indicative of strong decks are like the the Sultai uncommons, maybe. So like Micromancer, I mean Frost Frostist Rider, um, Bone Rattle. Okay. Let let's 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 let's, let's, let's take a look at a couple of these. Your card was with the Liberated Primeval with 87% of the games they had it in the... You don't even need to draw it. You just need to have it in your deck and you're winning. That's, that's the right. thing. Uh, then we have a Cleaving Sky Rider. I think that's indicative Ooh. of pretty strong, I guess, white and red deck because I don't think that you wanted to pick that card early. So if you picked it, it means you picked it late and it means that then you have probably a busted white mm. red deck because it means that white red was quite open. Guardian of New Benalia, Elder Dragon War... Runic Shot, was a, which is a card that I think you had very good success with. And I don't know if you're aware of that, but I mean, that was one of your better cards in general um, in this format uh, in terms of win rates. I think that partially because 
pairing it with Micromancer is a pretty powerful skill, and that mm -hmm. also makes it it being in the deck is worth a bit more than other card being in the deck because you can tutor for it so frequently. Right. Gin of the Fountain, that was surprising for me that you were winning so much while having it in the deck. Uh, okay. And also Lagomos, Queen Alanal, Rada, Colossal hmm. Growth, Mesa Cavalier. Even though you played it very rarely and you actually didn't want to pick it, you still managed to play some games with it because of the sheer volume of the games. Silver Scrutiny, Banalish Faith Bond there. Also a weird card there and Electrostatic Infantry and Chivalry, which doesn't say that much, I guess. Hmm. So these are, the, and, and, and any particular surprises in that list? Uh, I think I was thinking about this wrong. Uh, you make a really good point about Cleaving Skyrider and similar cards. It's like not many people want that particular card unless they have a certain deck. So like if you're if the lane is open and you're drafting it, you probably have a very good cohesive deck. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure the same with the Queen Alanal that basically maybe a couple of times you picked up, um, uh, you actually managed to get on the Celtai deck. It was actually not bad if it was like wide open, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And then Runic Shot, I I think is just like a super strong card. Um, there's very rare, you're not going to have a target for it. And like you said, it has synergies with Micromancer. Um, also, if you have Sulfur Time in your deck, you can actively tap things down, right? Like... You you can you can you can make targets happen with that card, and it's so mana efficient. And the Scry Two is definitely nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, yeah. this this is interesting. Um, is Jin, so you you kind of called out Jin. I think Jin of the Fountain is one of those cards where it's like I have a very good spells deck, and I just didn't get any terrors. So this is like a replacement for a top end game finisher in a good spells deck. So like, okay, yeah, that makes that Jin makes isn't the card sense. winning there. It's all the good spells. Mm, okay, yeah, just like you were on the good spells deck, but Talarian terrors were not flowing. Sometimes, I mean, you you know, you only open two point four of them per pod. Right. Uh, sometimes you will open zero or one, and maybe sometimes you won't get one. Uh, it makes sense. So um, what do you think are the cards that you played with the worst win rate when they were in your deck? And oh there are two cards there that are, again, well, I don't know if it's head and shoulders above, but head and shoulders below everyone else. <sighs> cards played with the worst win rate in my deck. Um, One of probably... those cards has been mentioned multiple times already. Chaplin? <laughs> nope. No? No, 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 no. Uh oh. Now I don't know. Um, what did we mention multiple times? You'll know when you see it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but I'm, I know uh... that as as a grinder, you very quickly forget the defeats. Um, that's why I don't remember. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's true. I honestly don't have good guesses on on a lot of this. I'm very curious about the data, but I would just be totally throwing okay. it around. Well, let's go with it then. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was aggressive sabotage. Oh. <laughs> uh, so decks with aggressive sabotage had um, uh, a, a poultry 51% win rate. Okay. And Butterfly Swarm is the other card that probably they were very similar decks as well um, yeah. uh, on occasions. And they were just not working. I think that some cards here are surprising to me. I think Artai Resurrected not particularly good win rate but maybe just because hey yeah, you don't see it lucky. too often sometimes a couple of drafts just don't go well exactly a resolute remember. reinforcement the card that you drafted 100 percent yeah. of the time that you've seen it um oh no that you played 100 percent of the time that you drafted it uh, uh is, is on that list what do we have here impede momentum children's restoration artillery blast or oh, juniper or the root weaver that you didn't like anyway um shadow prophecy is a bit of a surprise i guess although you know that that's the, the still 60 percent uh, gameplay win rate yeah uh, but i i think i i take it from all the older data that you were not extremely stoked to play uh shadow prophecy like some people you were not on the team is dig through time too uh i actually like shadow prophecy i uh I'm surprised to kind of see it because I, I prefer if I'm playing like a Demir control shell, I prefer playing at instant speed over sorcery speed. So like there's kind of a parallel between Phyrexian espionage and shadow prophecy and the pros and cons mm -hmm. of each. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, 
be, be, you know, be, be, because of course, uh, mm -hmm. gameplay data is interesting, but it's not as powerful as an explanatory thing for a card. Uh, we may actually look at the couple of cards that you'll be interested in uh, at the game and hand win rate um, when we go into that. So we, then you can add, maybe we can then look at Shadow Prophecy and Rex and Espionage. But interestingly, you have the Shivan Devastator there with 61% win rate, which was in the deck. Um, just just worse than Battle Rage Blessing. We heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> I would still take a Devastator in my deck on over the Battle Rage Blessing, um, which tells you something about the game's played uh, statistics power. Right, game in hand. That's that's where the money is. That, yeah. That's that's that, that's what what that shows really which card is uh, powerful. And let's look at first at the best cards. Okay. Um, Again, it's a mixture of uncommons, commons, and rares. But there's I think, only, I think, three rares and maybe three commons, and most of them are uncommons. So how I immediately think about this category is, like, the cards that make its it, their archetype tick are, like, the cards that are going to be good here. So, like, if I'm playing white decks and I'm drawing Cavaliers a lot at common, I think that's, like, a good sign that deck's doing well. Like I think that... The, I, so it, it, that, that, that's a good way of thinking, but I think I sh maybe should have done uh, just the stats on the commons. But I think that uh, because it's uncommon centric, it's yeah. going to be things that probably are occasionally played. Sure. Okay. Well, you said there's three rares. I think herd migration is probably maybe one of them. Drag under, like the big domain payoff cards might be yeah. up there. Um, I, I keep on saying Chaplin and it keeps on not being <laughs> anything. Um, that seems like a card that like, if you're building around it and you draw it, that's good. Uh, it's a bunch of multicolor stuff. Bunch of multicolor. That I can tell you. <laughs> Interesting. Um, uh, I think, I feel like Bone Rattle is probably one of those cards. It feels like you play and like the tempo of a game completely shifts. Um, right, let, 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 let's go there so we don't I, it speculate. Sounds like uh, I'm not, yeah, not getting any of these. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of multicolors, but Bone Rattle was not one of them. Um, but Riddick Shot, a card, again, I mentioned it before the, the, uh, it played in the deck that it was already high there, but it's even higher when you draw it, uh, partially also because of the Micromancer, because you choose to draw it in that situation. But uh, uh, that can explain everything in there because you just I know exactly you tutored for it six times during the format um, from Micromancer and the rest of the times you actually drew it naturally. But 85% of the games when you had it in hand, you just won. Elder Dragon War, I'm pretty sure that this is the kind of a card that you're going to abuse all the modes and um, uh, mm. whatever is possible. Uh, joint Exploration, again, smaller, smaller sample sizes for Joint Exploration and Thrill of Possibility. And then we have the Cleaving Skyrider, uh, Balmor, Tatiova, Najal. These are the multicolors I was talking about. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. Angel of Wrath, sort of uncommon, sort, sort of multicolor card. Yeah, for sure. But one card that impressed me insanely was Impulse. Mm. Because Impulse had a way bigger sample size than all the other cards in here um, in, in, in this category. So, um, um, you basically oh my god can i find the can i find this data please no that's that's the, the trophy list uh, but i think that the, you know it was played like 100 uh, you you drew it like 180 times if i remember of of the top of my head mm -hmm. and out of those 180 times you still manage to squeeze in like 75%, 77% win rate, uh, game in hand. So this is like, well, bordering insane in terms of like how good it was. So, um, impulse yeah, was... I, I think why, and if you look a lot of the cards on this list, a lot of them have like heavy decision, like thing, like decision points associated with them. It's like, when do you play your runic shot? When do you play your elder dragon war? When do you flash in your sky rider? So I think I think a lot of this is reflecting like abusing or leveraging cards that have decisions built into them and like using them better than in better situations uh, that maybe, you know, it, it gives you flexibility. Impulse gives you a lot of flexibility, right? Uh, Tatiova is just 
rawly powerful but like elder dragon War gives you a lot of flexibility runic shot is gives you a lot of like what is the creature i need to kill and when do i need to kill it and it gives you ability to kill a two drop if you feel like you're gonna fall behind early on it also gives you ability to like double spell in the mid game and it just lets you feel safe in the late game so it's like other than like stuff like namada which is clearly just like a powerful card right no matter what um i think a lot of these cards point to like if you make good decisions with them they probably perform pretty well better than like the average data set says i know this is game in hand when right just for my data but yeah yeah but again uh as i said impulse especially because um when you look at it uh, all those cards are not even close to that kind of um not close to that sample size and because of that the sample size of impulse it, it, it makes mind-boggling how much you want with that card when you mm. brew it uh, it's just uh insane but also like yeah, again you will have good decks so impulse is having a pretty good chance of yeah. uh, fetching something something useful so which cards do you think were the ones that were stopping you from winning when you drew them <laughs> Yeah, um, for some reason, my gut's going to um, Shadow Prophecy. It feels like I always like hated having to draw the cards and losing the two life with that card, uh, even though I like that card. Um, other other cards that I didn't do well when I did draw them at like maybe the uncommon level is like, I, I feel like I have bad luck curving out to so stuff like Electrostatic Infantry, maybe, or uh, uh, I don't know. Let's see. I definitely, I definitely see some cards that are quite surprising. I mean, obviously, some of them are just at the end of the graph, so they are quite probably not 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 that far from your average uh, sure. game and win rate. There's one very, I think, important common for one particular archetype that is uh, your absolutely bottom uh, <laughs> card, and that's something that was surprising for me. And okay. especially that I, I actually found quite quite a little bit of success with this card. So that's 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 uh, that's going to be interesting to see your take why why you think it's there. Let's like, let's go there. Okay. Directly, I'm talking to Keldon Strike Team uh, mm. at the 56.3 percent win game and hand win rate. Yeah, my guess is um, I I see. Okay, so like I'm going to use the four as a parallel. I see the four draft these like great like Mardu some combination of Mardu token decks. And he just goes, oh, look, three three lands and, and four spells, my opening hand on the play. And then I draft the exact same deck, and I'm like, oh, look, I have five lands and two spells on the draw every time. And Kelton Strike Team is one of those cards that, like, if you curve into it, it's amazing. And if you just draw it awkwardly, it is much less good. So yeah, I'm going to blame I'm my luck. <laughs> At, at the same time, we have a cleaving Skyrider somewhere here, like on the absolute top of your of your card win rates. Like the twenty two percentage point difference in game and hand win rate between those oh. two cards is just mind boggling to me. Because, I mean, cleaving Skyrider would be in the same deck most of the time. I, I assume in in your in your situation, it's just that the Kelvin Strike team just doesn't work for me. Also, yeah. Knight of Dawn's Light. That was shocking for me. That's the white first strike knight. I mean, this could be just I'm building my white decks poorly, right? Like this could be I just don't know how to build a good aggro deck in this format. Maybe. Then I have the rough weatherlight stalwart and shadow prophecy. I mean, also sixty percent win rate. That's not a bad deck. It's sure. um, it's just worse. I mean, we want to maximize your win rate, but uh, uh, but rough was pretty surprising to me to, to see it because you know I can accept gibbering barricade or breathing necromass, but rough I think that this, especially. With uh, such great results from Runic Shot from you, I would expect that this is exactly like the best friend of the Runic Shots uh, decks that you're playing. I think Raph is a is a victim of me loving the card too much and jamming uh -huh. into decks it doesn't belong in. Whereas like Runic Shot, you can kind of put in a lot of decks and you don't need the splash portion of it. But I'm probably jamming Raph into like aggressive is it decks that it doesn't need to be there. And Miria's Outrider, I think that this is also probably a card that you play quite a lot, and that might be also the same situation. I don't know. I mean, about... is this, you know, it's 61% win rate. It's not far below your average win rate. It's just slightly lower, so it would be interesting to look at it. Yeah. Uh I'm not sure about Outrider. I don't I don't recall like 
you know, with my, my shoddy memory ever, like ever having a lot of thoughts of like, wow, these outriders are just not doing a lot for me. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I am a little surprised to see outrider there, especially when you look at like the cards surrounding it, like toxic abomination, for example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, has a slightly higher game than hand win rate, which uh, which yeah. is which is a bit shocking. I I I don't know, but I, I think Outrider will have a much higher uh, win rate, um, a I, much higher sample size. So that's yeah, I think something that you can have like moderate confidence in that uh, that the win rate was pretty lower. Than, and I think than Outrider there. is one of those cards that's like a surrogate top end if your deck just kind of starts failing a bit. And you're like, well, I kind of need some finishers. Let me jam it into this deck, even though it's not the ideal deck for it. So, like, there are certain cards that kind of fit those slots where it's like emergency uh, backup plan. I just need to be able to somehow kill my opponent. <laughs> and I feel like Outrider is probably a victim of fitting that role, maybe mm. uh, a little too easily. I just so uh, to the chat, and I think Smote is. Um in chat says that toxic abomination had its moments with rata drabic well the problem is that uh, chris never bothered drafting rata drabic despite giving ample opportunities to do so he refused mm -hmm. them every single time <laughs> probably rightfully so um okay and um well basically that's that 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 concludes the data part of it uh, oh, but um okay. how did you find that kind of introspective because i know that you sometimes uh, again um don't look at the data with too much interest because you prefer to figure out the format yourself mm -hmm. fair because um because your process is different you have your win rate that is you know sort of a proving track record that you don't need the data basically um but how do you feel looking at your own data because that's a different thing because you can sort of believe that um, the person that produced that data is worth uh, listening i assume yeah so i think uh you know, the data of this talk shows that I focus more on big picture trends and like general pros and cons of the format uh, from like a, a very high level perspective. But once you get into the nitty gritty details, I fall apart in terms of accurately predicting anything that happened. And so I feel like uh, this was kind of, you know, confirmed that. I guess a bit where I just, I couldn't tell you individual cards, how they perform on stuff, but I had pretty good idea of terms of like colors and when they were hot and when they weren't. So this was really interesting. It was informative, cringy, just because of the numbers of drafts I did are now public and everyone knows about that. <laughs> so that's a little <laughs> uncomfortable, but. <laughs> well, I mean, you did those drafts. There's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> There's nothing yeah. to be ashamed of, but okay. I mean, obviously, um, I'm super stoked that I was uh, given the privilege to look at your data. I love looking at individual data of, of, of people that know what they're doing because it gives you a different overview of the format. And, um, you know, I mean, um, obviously, I, I will share, share the, the, the files with you if you want uh, at some stage and yeah. um, I'll send you the, the slides so you can take a look at them yourself and cry about um, how frequently you played those reinforcements without too much uh, of success. Um, <laughs> But um, I'm pretty sure that 99% of the people in the chat know exactly where to find you. But just in mm -hmm. case we missed one, could you please let us sure. know? Sure, sure. So uh, as a streamer, I'm at Florida Mun on Twitch. You can find me on Twitter as well. Part of the Draft Lab drafting team where you can you know, follow all those guys. We have a Twitter at Draft Lab. So highly recommend that in the podcast. And those are basically the two places you could uh, find my Magic the Gathering uh, output on the internet. Yeah, just to add from my side, I, I do listen to every single episode of the uh, Draft Lab podcast because I think it's worth it. And I'm also a member of the of the Discord because I think it's worth it. So um, if anyone uh, is still on the barricade and, and, and not sure, I recommend it. Um, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, and also I need to thank my sponsor yet again, uh, mtgazon.com. And I would like to thank Fake Jake Brown, who's helping me with the, releasing this in the podcast version. And as we are on the podcast version, uh, I would like to thank SSQ and Mana Junkie, two people that provide the music for my intro. And with that, I'll see you 
probably in a couple of days because I will record something on Brothers War. But um, normally I say next week, but it's going to be earlier than that. But till then, see ya.